What is up, guys? It is so good to be back with you here at, oh boy, <laughs> Battle Creek. Battle Creek. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I did it. So apparently, last time I was here, I, met, I, I got screwed up on the name. It, you know, it was the church at, but, you know, but I hear that since I've been here and made fun of it, that they changed the name. So thank you. That was a good call. Good job, Alex. So uh, I had a friend call me like Thursday, and he goes, hey, man, I'm, I'm not going to be there. He lives in this area. He said, I'm not going to be able to make it, but do you remember last year when you got up and totally didn't know where you were? And I said, well, I, believe me, I've got it fixed, and I, I can't wait to be at Battlefield. And he went, you screwed it up again. That's the wrong name. <laughs> so anyway, so good to be back. Um, I hate missing Alex, uh, which, ergo, that's why I'm here, because uh, he's not here. And uh, but I hate to, I hated to miss him. I love that guy. You guys got a great pastor, a great team here. Uh, I've been working with these guys and gals. I want to thank the worship team. Uh, they were so good. Because I've been to some places, not so much. <laughs> But you guys uh, got a great team, great energy. Um, just love this church. Love being here. I have. Uh, I was. My wife just sent me something. I guess they put up last time, and cause I'd forgot what I talked about. I think I mentioned evangelism. Uh, we will talk about that some as well. Uh, some of you guys wondering what's going on. Oh, by the way, I I got a haircut. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's starting to get really nice. The hotter it gets, and so I'm like, oh, you know. It's good for that to be gone. Um, and uh, what else is going on? Oh, I had a grandbaby this week. Uh, yeah, John, Luke, and Mary Kate had their second. And so I got to see her for just a second before I came up here. And uh, I actually got to see when they, you know, because of COVID now, when they brought her home, which actually they're staying with us right now, uh, I got to see her and her brother uh, meet each other for the first time. And I said, I call him Woody. I said, Woody, your life's never going to be the same. You just became second. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was a lot of fun. Sadie's uh, pregnant. She'll be due just in a few weeks. I know she's spoken here. She's tell all of you hello. And uh, yeah, so man, I've had, a, I've had quite the time. Um, I have a new TV show. Uh, it's called At Home with the Robertsons. It's on Facebook Watch, and it's an interview show. And so it's kind of moving interview. So we do some talk, and then we go out and do some fun stuff, kind of some Louisiana stuff. We did crawfishing, and, um, and that's been fun. I was, uh, uh, I was watching, I was actually sitting at a coffee shop the other day, waiting on my coffee, and I'm watching a cut of one of the episodes right on my phone. And this young African-American guy came up, and he's like, this face planted on my window, and he had a tent on him, and uh, he looked like he was without home. I was, didn't want to make an assumption, but that's what it looked like. And he taps on the window, and I said, hey, buddy, what's going on? He said, uh, you got any change for a homeless man? I said, oh, man, you're in luck. I got a lot of change. So I grab all this change, and he, he looks down at my phone. He goes, I can see you're a big fan of Duck Dynasty. I said, you know what? I love that show. It was one of my favorite shows. He was like, oh, that was a good show. That was a good show. And he goes, uh, <laughs> this next thing, I don't know if this is true or not. This is what he said, not me. He goes, I'll tell you, them boys, their fashion sense has spread to the hood. I said, really? He was like, oh, yeah, I see a lot of camouflage. <laughs> I said, that's awesome, man. And uh, so I didn't, I wanted to give him something more than just change. And so I had this book I was reading. I didn't want to, I had my Bible. I needed it at the time. So I was like, here, and I had a spiritual book I was reading. I said, here, man, why don't you take this book and read it? He goes, yeah, I will. And so I never forget, he's just walking off reading this book with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And I guess technically I paid for the cigarette now that I think about it. I didn't even thought about that. But uh, anyway, so you never know. We do have a new show that's out. Um, it's kind of, it's hot topics. It's like, uh, you know, just feel good. 
things that everybody wants to talk about, like uh, racism and, you know, uh, kneeling for the flag. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we discussed, but we, we really wanted to do a show to try to be a bright light. I realize that, uh, you know, it's a funky time and everybody's arguing at each other and yelling and screaming. So, Corey and I, my family, we just want to do something that maybe could help that, maybe bridge that gap. And so that was the the interesting thing uh, for us was to do that. And so, um, so yeah, we've launched into that, and um, I'm going to launch into this little lesson today. And uh, I just pray that you hear uh, from God today, uh, less of me, but more of him for sure. Anyway, uh, I did a reality TV show for about five years, if you don't know who I am, and uh it's called Doug Dynasty. I played Willie on the show. Uh, that was my character. <laughs> really helped launch my career. It was a great uh, show to start out with. But if you, if you go all the way back, I, I learned this in reality TV. Um, and here's kind of how it works. I don't know if any of you guys have been on a show. Some of you look like you should. But um, um, so here's how it goes. You kind of like, I mean, the next day, you kind of got an idea of kind of what you're going to do. You know, it's planned out. And true reality TV is a hidden camera. Like, that, they'll really get you there. But if you want to do a show where, you know, you've got to film, it's got to have a beginning and an end. And so you know there's cameras right there. Uh, and invariably, something would happen that was totally like you didn't even see it coming. And it looked like it was going to ruin the entire shoot of what you were doing. And it was like, oh, no, this whole day's ruined because of this, because this happened. And, uh, but I learned doing TV, wait a minute, when something happens like that, usually that's what the show's about, like make it about that. And so you have to spin and go, okay, this happened, we didn't think we were going to get it done, and now we're going to do some, make something good out of it. And so I'll tell you a story. The first time we ever shot, so this is by even before Duck Dynasty, this was a show on an outdoor channel called Duck Commander. So we had set this up. I talked to uh, my father, and I said, hey, look, these guys want to shoot a show. It's going to kind of be like a reality show. And, uh, and he goes, nah, that's not going to work. And I was like, well, we can, I mean, we'll probably sell more duck calls. And he really wasn't into it. And I said, well, let's just, you know, let's try so he says, okay, we get Jace, we get Cy, and the, the opening scene was going to be in the duck blind, so we are just going to hunt. And uh, so everything's set up. Uh, the call time was probably 5 o'clock in the morning to meet up at the boats. And uh, now for me, the night before, I'd stayed up late. I'd had an issue I was dealing with with another person, so I'd stayed up late, kind of on the phone with them. I set my alarm and go to bed. Well, my phone, at like 3.13, my phone just went zip, and it stayed at 3.13. It didn't keep counting time, all right? And so, therefore, I totally overslept. So I remember I opened my eyes thinking, oh, what a beautiful day that I can see outside, everything, the sun, and I shouldn't be seeing the sun. I should be somewhere else. At this moment, have you ever had that like panic where you're like, oh, no, I really screwed this up. And so now let me go back when I was supposed to be there. This is at the boats that morning. The film crew's there. They're getting all the stuff in the boats. Uh, Dad's there. Jace is there. Everybody's getting set up. And then the director realizes they're fixing to push the boats off. And he's like, Willie's not here. And he goes, whoa, whoa, where's Willie? And my father, without even, I mean, never even, his heartbeat didn't raise a bit. And he looked, he said, oh, I imagine he's laid up in bed right now sleeping. <laughs> and the director goes, well, we can't film the show. Like, that's, that's part of the show. And Phil goes, well, I'm going hunting. Y'all can turn the cameras on. You don't have to turn them on. I can leave you here. I'm going hunting. I know where I'll be. And the director's like, this whole day is ruined. Like, I mean, this is over. And so they go out to the blind, and they're going to do what they do. So about 9 o'clock, <laughs> I make that phone call to Jace. I said, Jace, dude, I overslept. He was like, you think? I said, yeah. <laughs> Man, my alarm clock got stuck at 3.13. It's something's wrong with you. Yeah, yeah. I said, no. Nah, Anyway, I'm coming down. I, I'm, I'm coming there. I need, uh, can you come get me? No, I'm not coming to get you. I said, well, I need a boat. Where's a boat? So in Louisiana, we, I don't know if you've seen these. We have these little P-rows. They're little, uh, 
small boats that you get in a paddle, and uh, it's a, maybe a Cajun thing, but it's a really, really small boat. And uh, he goes, I think there's a P-Row behind the shed. So grab the P-Row, paddle out there, and I said, all right. So I'm burning it down there. I get to, I get to my parents' house. I go behind the shed, and I'm, I'm looking. that It's a P-Row, but it's half of a P-Row. <laughs> like literally... Where the seat would be, that's gone, and there's a back. It's, I mean, it's literally that big. And I'm looking, thinking, what in the world? What, how are they riding? That? Like, I've never even seen this thing. I found out later it's for pulling behind your boat for carrying things or a small dog. <laughs> it's not made for this. I mean, ever. There's no seat. And I'm thinking, well, I got to get out there. I, I mean, this is this was the option. I guess I guess they're riding these. I don't know. So I get it. Now, guys, I've done some incredible things in my life. What I pulled off was the most incredible thing by getting in this boat without it tipping over. So I I snuggle in this thing and I realize, whoa, I can't move. I probably got this much freeboard all the way around. And I have a little tiny paddle. And so, but the deal is when you paddle it, it just totally goes this way. Because a normal boat, you know, moves like this. All right, this guy just goes this. So I go, uh, uh, and here I go off like this <laughs> through the woods. And then the shots start firing out. Yeah, they're still hunting. So I, I, I stop. Chase, I'm in the woods. Stop shooting. Okay, Willie's in the woods. He's fixing to pop out somewhere. And when I popped out, guys, I popped out on the open water. My father said it just looked like a fat man (laughs) sliding on top of water. (laughs) Because you couldn't see the boat at all. And they're like, what is he riding? They're like, we have no idea. His arms are moving, but it looks like he's just floating on water. (laughs) Uh, so I pull up and I'm thinking the director is going to be furious with me and he goes Willie thank you you just made the show like (laughs) we couldn't have scripted or made up or come up with anything better than what you just did see because what we were gonna do was not going to be near as great as what happened. And, and we never saw it coming, right? We took something bad, and then here comes something else. And so that was the way it was. Not actually over years and years of doing TV, stuff like that happened a lot. You'd run out of gas. Something would happen. It'd be like, oh, no, we can't do what we're going to do. But then usually that's what you need to work on. And so um, that's kind of the idea today I was thinking about with us, even in our personal lives, has has something like that ever happened to you? Uh, one, has your clock ever just got stuck? Have you felt like in life, man, my clock's been stuck and I'm sleeping when I should be awake and um, I'm just, I'm, I'm held back. And maybe it's something else totally, like I didn't plan my phone to go out. In fact, that's never happened. And has something come up to where it's like you didn't see it coming but then that's maybe what you need to deal with. And I've had things like that. If you're married, I guarantee you that's happened. If you have children, 100%. Like you didn't plan it, and now, but it's, it's what you have to deal with. And so that's what happens too in our marriages as well. Something will come up and you just don't want to deal with it, but maybe that's really what you're supposed to be dealing with. And so I've seen this happen in my own life, and so I want to to check ourselves today and think about it. And then I, I even thought about our, our country. Um, does it just seem like something is way off? <laughs> you get that sense, uh, maybe it's just me, but it's like something's wrong. Something's weird. Something's happening. Uh, and so I was trying to figure this out. And, uh, you know, and we have this show now, so we're talking about these issues. And so I try to come up with what are these things. And so I, I've got a few, and I'm going to give you this idea. I'm, I'm going to call it worldly wisdom, all right, worldly wisdom. So there's two kinds of wisdoms. What I want to talk about here for a second is worldly wisdom. 
So you think about the different areas, you know, that we deal with in our lives. Think about uh, big tech, all right? Does that scare any of you guys? I mean, when I'm standing there and I look at my phone, it goes, you want a donut, don't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go 400 yards up the road, there's one right there on the right. And I'm like, maybe that's a terrible example because 99% of you could assume I wanted a donut, so maybe the, maybe the phone's not that accurate. <laughs> But have you noticed that, that big tech, these are intellectual people, these are really smart people who have figured out really smart things with really big bases of data, and they can start moving even people, and they can start suggesting perhaps what you think, what you think about, where you go to, you'll get patterned, what you should read, and, and you see that moving, and it kind of frightens me. I'm like, whoa, because I don't even realize I'm being led and I'm being marketed to, I'm being studied uh, with the data. That's big tech. That's smart people, intellectuals, thinking we know what's best for you, and that kind of frightens me. It's worldly wisdom. It's worldly stuff because it doesn't lead me uh, oftentimes to godly things. They're not thinking about my spiritual life. Um, how about education? How about our scholars? Uh, do you trust these guys? <laughs> They're smart. They got degrees. Uh, think about our universities, even our high schools now, what they're teaching our children, what is being taught, um, what um, is being done there. I have kids in college, and so, yeah, it frightens me when I'm thinking, like, they've got my, my kid for four years of putting what they think needs to be in their brain. It's kind of frightening because I don't know if we have the same ideas about how we live life. So education scares me a little bit. Um, all right, now this one, this one doesn't have any problems. How about politics? Oh, my goodness. I make my eyes cross there. Something's off. Something's way off, right? It just doesn't seem like this. Have we? Has it been like this or is it just, man, it just seems such a wide gap we're so far away from each other. It's the world. It's the world. We vote people in, but it's the world. You're seeing the reflection of worldly wisdom. Mute now, I'm really going to start sounding old, so young guys are going to be like, what? Well, how about music? Seem, something seem off there? <laughs> I would read you some of the, I mean, some of the top hits from the last year. I can't even read them in church. Actually, I can't read them anywhere. I mean, some of the lyrics, um, it just seems off about what we're singing about. Fashion. Um, all right, now somebody, I know a lot of you have heard this story. Surely somebody, though, they showed up here to church. Anybody see the devil shoes? Yeah. So it's shoes. Somebody's like, what did you say, devil shoes? Yeah, they made a pair of devil shoes. Uh, a company did. They were 666. They made 666 of them. It was a Bible verse where Satan was thrown down into heaven, uh, from heaven. Um, yeah, it was basically worshiping the devil. They were over $1,000. And you would say, well, who would buy that? 665 people bought a pair. I guess one didn't get out. So Nike sued them. But that's one piece of fashion. Don't even get me started on the other fashion. They're making a little bit of material <laughs> go a little bit of way, so, but we see that, we see that worldliness, right, reflected in that. Um, just think about journalism, heck, even scientists and even doctors, like, I just don't know, sometimes, like, I don't know who I can trust, I don't know what they're, I don't know what exactly they're doing, just seems like a lot of worldly wisdom, and maybe, guys, maybe, that's what we should be focusing on. Because here's the thing, we can talk about it, but do we have any answers? Do we have any rebuttals? Do we have something that's better, that's different? Or are we just going to gripe and complain? So, ah, you know, this place is going down. This actually came up a couple of thousand years ago as well. We'll go to Romans 1. <clears throat> Romans 121. He says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. 
and their thinking became futile, and their hearts were darkened. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their heart. So if, you're, if your gut's telling you, or something spiritual inside of you is telling you, something is up with the world, it's, it's right. You're right. It is. And you can see right here in Romans, notice, notice the downward. It's usually not straight down. It's a slide. It's going down. He, you start here, then it gets darkened, then God gives people over. But you can see it like this, the slide. It decays, all right? And it's all this worldly thinking. It's not godly thinking at all. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. We're going to kind of camp out here in 1 Corinthians at the early uh, beginning of it. This is where Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Once again, we're going to see this same idea. This is 2,000 years ago, by the way. This is in America today. <laughs> you can make that decision. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. I just want to stay right there one second. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So the message of the cross, what we're doing here, what we sing about here, who we sing our praises to, where we show up, the message of the cross, it's foolishness. Because how much of the message of the cross are you seeing getting played in all the areas that I told you about? You see a lot of the message of the cross coming out of that? I don't. In fact, it's like, ah, uh, it's foolishness. Oh, that's the, what's that, the old Bible thing? Yeah, yeah. Let's move on to something more important, right? And that's what Paul is saying. He says, but to us, us, probably most of us, some of us in here, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. There's your intellects. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? Do you believe that, guys? See, we've got to figure out whether we're going to do worldly wisdom or we're going to do God's wisdom. All right? We've got to get back to God's wisdom, not just get back to normal. All right? Because I'm afraid that what some of us are doing is we're just we're getting, trying to get back to something. We're just getting back to the wrong thing. Because we're thinking, oh, back when it was normal. Okay, so you can take what's going on right now. Everybody's heard of COVID-19, all right? Well, we got to get back to normal. We got to get back to before when this happened. But my question is, was before when this happened, was there a problem or not? I'm saying, no, there were problems way before this happened. In fact, in some of the problems, I'm like, whoa, I've even seen bigger problems that we needed to deal with that were there before, we just didn't notice them because everything seemed normal. And so, therefore, we try to get back to normal. Uh, COVID is interesting, and, uh, and I'm 100% sad. And I know people have passed away. I know people who have passed away. I know people who have been in the hospital. Um, but it almost, it almost to me became like uh, the, the little worldly religion. It turned into religion, Right? It, uh, you could, um, uh, the vaccine was like the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all right? We hope, we don't know, maybe, we're not sure. Your Savior, you could pick that. Was it the former president? Is it the next president? Is the Savior Fauci? Is it someone else? Is it, so you could kind of pick whatever flavor of Savior you wanted. The leaders that told us what to do seem really hypocritical because <laughs> they would preach one thing and then you would see them as soon as they were out with their family. You're like, wait a minute, hang on, you're not doing what you just told me to do. So it seemed like religion. I don't know about you guys up in Oklahoma. Was there any judging going on? <laughs> oh, my God. 
I didn't. I wasn't quarantining because I was scared of getting COVID. I was quarantining just because everybody was judging each other so bad. I was like, I can't even do it. I called my father about about a month into the quarantine. I said, Phil, how you doing during the quarantine? You okay? You need anything? He said, Will, I've been quarantining for about three decades. <laughs> I said, Yes, you have. Guys, we got to get back to God's wisdom, not just getting back to normal. That's not our goal is to get back to normal. Because I'm telling you, you're getting back before, it was earthly, worldly wisdom as well. Um, And even in the church, we're kind of like, well, we need, well, people, there's many people here. I liked it when everybody showed up. There was more people. Let me just tell you, if if your line that you're trying to hit, if your defining principle is whether or not you can show up for one hour on a day that most of us don't work, and that's where you've got the line of real Christianity, you have missed the whole message of the New Testament, okay? It ain't about that. That is one speck of this whole thing, which is whether or not we show up. And in fact, if you threw your whole faith away because of the global pandemic, I've got a question, was it there before anyway or not, right? Right? I mean, that's going to make you, you know, we'll stand here and sing, you know, I trust in Jesus. He's the way. I put my faith and hope in him. And then we almost seem to run out going, ah, I'm going to die. I'm so scared. I used that COVID thing for so many people. It was such a great starter. It was like, I'm scared to death. I'm going to die. And it just was like a wide open door going, what's the fear? What, What are we so scared of? And then, boom, we can talk right into that life. Because our faith was built for things like this. The message of the cross is built for times like this. That's what the message of the cross is for. I mean, just think about it. Think about when the message of the cross came out. Right after the the Jesus came came back from the dead. The faith was out there. Look. The, there's, it's, we're not talking about a slight chance. The people who followed Jesus, his disciples, they didn't have a slight chance they may die. They had a 100% chance they died because of the name of Jesus. This message, this cross has been through way harder things than that. And people have been steadfast, continued to preach the gospel. Had it not, guys, we wouldn't be sitting here because it happened halfway across the planet at a whole nother country, that's where this happened. The message had spread all the way for a couple of thousand years and made it right here, right here to where we're at. The message of the cross, God's wisdom wins the day, guys. We can't end up acting and thinking like the world. This is why this is important to me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the evangelism director at my church. This is new. I don't get paid. So I think I'm paying them, but anyway. Uh, so I'm the evangelism director because I'm passionate about evangelism. And so what we did was we had a, a, there was a next steps room where you could go in and learn more about the church, you know, if you joined the crew. And uh, I said, no, we need something different. So we came up with a first step. I'm interested in that guy making that first step. First step to what? First step to faith. There's got to be a first step, right? So I want people who've got questions. You got questions. We got answers. We got the answers to what this is. And people would even raise their hand, right? They'd give their life to the Lord at the end of a sermon. But I was convinced some of them didn't know what they were doing. Because I'd see them raise their hand. Jesus is going to be the Lord of my life. And they'd get in the lobby and go like, all right, let's go to Captain D's. I was like, well, hang on now. Let's make sure we got this right. Let's make sure we will walk through with people and talk. So I say, we got this room. So people come in this room with all kinds of questions. It's the funnest room in the church building, believe me. It's right where the world is meeting the gospel. And it's uh, exciting to me. It may scare some of you half to death. It's fun. It gets weird. People come in messy. Had a lady come in uh, with her guy. They're sitting there, and I start 
preaching the gospel, and she's she's telling me about a lot of worldly wisdom. Um, she said she had tried to commit suicide that week on the interstate, which brought other people into play. She said she was trying to kill herself and the dude. The dude doesn't say anything. He's just staring at me the whole time. I just go, and he's just staring at me. I said, you got a relationship with Jesus? He's like, nope. I said, all right, you need this. And then we went to her. A lot of worldly wisdom, drugs, stuff from the world, right? Stuff from the world's like, hey, feel bad, take this, do this. She had bought into it. And they go on their way. Had another lady come in. <laughs> she said, I can't get baptized. I can't get baptized. So why not? She goes, because of this relationship I'm in. I said, let me guess. He's not your husband. She said, I'm living in sin. <laughs> I said, hey, the first spiritual thing you said so far. <laughs> but I had this girl come in. I'm going to call her Melanie. This one, this one took the cake for me. So it was like, like we got two services like this. So normally things happen at the end of service. They come in. So it was during the second service, during, pastor was out preaching, and I'm actually just sitting in the room, just kind of getting things prepared, getting ready. And this girl, this real strange girl, she like sticks her head in the room. And so it's me and a pastor sitting there. She's looking around the room like this, and I could tell she ain't been in no church building. She's looking around, and she said, um, what room is this? So she's wandering during the preaching, is basically what she's doing. I said, this is where you make the first step for Jesus Christ. And she went, O-S-H, vowel, and another letter. <laughs> and I just died laughing. <laughs> that pastor got her there so fast, you'd have thought there was a, a, a buffet going on. He's like, yeah, let me go. Uh, Willie, good luck with that one. Uh, let me get out of here. <laughs> and that's how that conversation started. I said, I, I told her, I said, you don't know who I am, but I'm going to tell that story to a few people. Because <laughs> why do we expect worldly people to act like believers in God? They, I don't expect it when they do stuff like that. And she came in. I said, come in. Let's talk. And she was out there, man. She said, I don't believe in this religion. I believe in energy. I said, ah, oh, energy. Um, and she went through just, I mean, she had actually studied, but it was a lot of just worldly stuff on the internet, just stuff she had come up with. And she goes, I hate churches. It's religion was started by white people. I said, ah, Melanie, you're incorrect. They were brown. <laughs> white people got on board somewhere there along the way. But I just listened to all this worldly. That's why this is important to me, because do we have answers? Or we don't, or we just going like, huh, I have no idea. We got to know what to get back to. First Corinthians three. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about when she came in that room. Hang on, before we go to before she came in that room, I was thinking about coming into to rooms and being awkward. We were on this duck hunt one time in Oregon. And we stayed at this real fancy motel. It was one you could drive right up to your door. Had a full glass uh <laughs> looked like it was it was nasty. So it was me and but it was me and Phil and Jason side. We were nasty too. They, it fit us well. So we all had our own rooms, right? And um, so Phil's in his my dad's in his bed, and um, Phil said, "Will, I was just wearing all I had on was my armor all, which meant under armor." Uh, <laughs> it was under armor underwear is what he had on. I knew I knew where he was. I said, okay. So Phil's just sitting there on his bed, lights are out, and as you could see from the parking lot, there was a light there, and Phil said something started jiggling the door, doorknob. So somebody's coming into his room. So there's a guy coming into Phil's room. Now, if, if you don't know who my dad is, if we've got a picture, all right. Can you imagine walking in a room and that's in there? Well, like my father does, his shotgun was right beside him. 
So he said, I just grabbed my shotgun, and Phil's just sitting with his back up on the wall in his bed. He said, this old boy comes in there. We don't know if he was trying to steal something. We don't know what, why he was in this room, okay? And the guy's looking like this, and he had not eyes, and he looks, and he sees Phil. And he just gets down like this, <laughs> and his hands go like this. And he said, uh, he looks at Phil, and Phil goes, what's your story, son? <laughs> and the old boy goes, wrong room. <laughs> and Phil said he kept doing this. He closed the door, and he said, I looked down in the parking lot, 50 yards, he's still doing this. <laughs> you want to talk about an OS? <laughs> that moment, yeah, that would, have, that would have been one right there. But she came in. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you're still not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. Are you not acting like mere men? I love when Paul just gets right to the point. You're still worldly. That's 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 1. He addressed them as brothers. And kind of bragged on them. And then three, he said, you're still acting worldly. Guys, we got we to gotta realize, we got to be careful not to think and act just like the world. Because that's a struggle. As what the Bible say, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Because we got to live here. But we're moving on, man. This is just, we're just coming through. But if we don't watch it, we'll call up, we'll start acting just like them. We'll start thinking just like them. We'll get caught up in their fears and their anxiety and all the things of the world. And we as believers get caught up in that same thing. We got to make sure it doesn't come in our church where we're at, where we're not thinking and acting just like the world. Because I think, so, are you this guy, or you, do you for sure know this person? That says, you know, we got to get back to we got to get back to the old days, back when it was good, things were a lot better. You ever heard that? We, that's what we need to go back to. No, we don't need to go back to the old days. We need to go back to God's wisdom, because the old days. So what you're doing is like it's some kind of heaven on earth we had at some point. When I was a kid, we. Because what we fail to realize is what you're looking back at that you're saying those were the good old days, someone else is looking at thinking those were the good old terrible days because it's bad for somebody else. And it's confusing, I think, to non-believers as they look at us going, well, yeah, but you thought that was a good time in history? And we need to answer for that. Because we need to look back and say, no, no, that, yeah, there was that. Yeah, there was, yeah, it was bad for these people. Yeah, it was bad for women. So you keep going back, going, how far do you want to go back? When was it good? No, it was still worldly. It's still worldly wisdom. You can go all the way back. Well, let's go back 2,000 years. Well, we would all be killed for doing what we're doing today. Okay, don't go back there. All right, let's go. Somewhere, and I'm telling you, if you go through the history of time, you're not going to find it. You're not going to find it because God never promised that here. God said, that's up here. That's not down there. So we got to make sure we're not thinking and acting like we got to go back to something that's really not there. Because what will happen is, it's just a pipe dream. It's not leading you anywhere. It's not going to motivate you. What are you going to march around the street and say, let's go back to the old days when things were bad? No, it's... Guys, it's moving. It's moving. And what you'll become is you'll just become really negative. You won't be productive. And then you'll get a sense of apathy. And you know what you'll do? Mostly nothing. Just sit there and gripe about it. The whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. You're probably right. Are you going to do something about it? Or you're just going to be the one to let everybody know what's going on. I think we all see what's going on. We've got to have answers. <clears throat> we got to realize 
we got to get back to what is our motivation? What was Paul's motivation? 1 Corinthians 1, 4, 14. said, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Where Paul, I just see him sitting there going, did I baptize somebody? Who else did I baptize? Hey, hey. Who did I baptize? How about we live our lives so good that we forget the good things we do? How about, for Christ not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. There's Paul's motivation. He came to preach about Jesus. Everything he did, all the letters that he wrote, he came to do that. The right motivation, that's going to guide your path. That's going to keep you out of that worldly wisdom. And for Paul, it was preaching the message of the cross. Now you may be sitting there going, oh, I ain't a preacher. Can you tell about what Jesus has done in your life? Can you tell about where you were, where you are now? Of course you can. You have a mouth. I guarantee you talk about other things. We've got to get to where that's our motivation. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are in Christ and your sins have been washed away, congratulations. Now let's go tell someone else about that. Because someone told you or someone told your mom or your dad or whoever it was that got you here. So we've got to go out there and that's got to be your motivation. It's got to be all our motivations. 1 Corinthians 15. It's my favorite chapter. I like how it starts, and I like how it ends. It starts right here. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel, and this is my reminder to you guys. I preached to you, Paul preached to them, you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise, you've believed in vain. There's an if and an otherwise there, guys. If. Otherwise. Otherwise, you're in the worldly wisdom. Otherwise, you fell away. Otherwise, you forgot the importance of it. For what Paul received, he passed on to them as of first importance. Didn't say prayer. Didn't say going to church. Paul says this is the most important thing right here. What is it, Willie? That Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised, thank God, on the third day, according to the scriptures, that death, that burial, that resurrection of Jesus. Paul says that is the most important thing. That is number one. That is what we tell people. That is what we get back to. That is what we got to get back to. It's not the things of this world. It's that message right there. It's simple. Don't overcomplicate it. And I, everybody I sit with and we talk, we start right there. And we say, well, that's our standard right there. Now, how does that reflect in your life? I've watched people all morning reenact that. Romans 6 says, when we die to our sin, we, we, in that water of baptism, there's a death, a symbolic burial, and you're raised to a new life. So when guys come around, you're like, what do you tell them, Willie? I go, well, how's your life with God? Let's hear it. What's your story? What's your story? And they start talking, and I start writing. And then I say, well, here's the gospel. How does your life reflect that? Where's the new life? Because see, some old boy comes in and says, hey, I, yeah, I think I'm six years old. I got baptized some church camp. Okay, great. How's it been since then? <laughs> well, now I'm 32, and it ain't been good. So we get that message out, the message of the gospel out. I will say this. The guy that was sitting there beside the girl that was going to commit suicide, two weeks later he came back up to the church and got baptized. And he didn't say a word. And I thought, that little boy wouldn't listen to me at all. Melanie came back as well. She didn't come to the room. She came back up there. That was her first time ever in a church building is when she walked in that room, stuck her head in there. First time ever to a church building. She came back. One of my team members saw her. 
said, hey, we have missed you. I'm glad you came back. Tears welled up in her eyes. She goes, I'm so embarrassed. I was in there, and I, y'all were, Willie was talking about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and there was another one. I can't remember what it was. And she goes, I was so embarrassed. Y'all probably just thought I was crazy. And, and she said, no, I don't think you're crazy. You're searching for something. Show's changed for you. Show's changed for you. And tears start falling in her eyes. She goes, I just want connection. I'm just desperately looking for something to connect. Because she bought in to what the world was telling her. She bought in and she looks up and she's miserable. Guys, why do we think that's going to somehow solve our problems? We get caught up in it too, even as the church. You're not going to be effective out there with telling the gospel message if you look just like what you're saying you need to be out of. You should look way different. People should look at you going, whoa, why are you smiling? Why are you happy? Where's that joy coming from? Where's that hope coming from? Because see, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, you know how it ends? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Hey, we're talking about beating death. Because we're all going to die. COVID has gotten some people. Cancer will get a lot of people in here. Cars will get somebody in here. We're all going to die. When are we going to start investing in something beyond here? And telling people about that. Maybe that time's today. I know people, there's people in here. That alarm clock been stuck for a while. You, you've been at 313 for a long time. You may not even know it. The person sitting beside you probably does. <laughs> See, the show needs to change for you. So you're doing, you're trying to go back for what you thought you were going to do, but it needs to change. You need to refocus. And that can happen today. People that are listening to me online, that can happen. I'm a product of a guy, that scary guy on that screen, he was a guy who, had he not turned his life around, my life wouldn't have turned around. So make that today. Make that decision today. If you want to get baptized today, I'm going to hang around. We'll be out there. Make the decision. Bury that old man. Bury that old person. Start living again. Live for something that these people that are so miserable in the world, give them something that they can see. Jesus is living in us. It's the only way they can see it. Make that decision today. Father, I just thank you for this group of people. Father, I know you move in so many mysterious ways. and But in some ways, Father, you just move in obvious ways. Father, I just pray that we're not worldly, that we go back to your wisdom. We trust you. Father, we believe in you. We worship you today. We pour our hearts out to you just for a short time, and we'll do it again over and over. But thank you for never giving up on us. Thank you, Father, for giving us hope in a life that seems so dark. Father, help us to be bright lights. Help this church body here to be a bright light in this community. Father, I pray if there's people who need to make decisions for you, Father, I pray that they do it today. I pray that they come down front, they ask for help, Father. They look to seek you. We love you, Father. We're desperately longing for you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for forgiving our sins. We give you everything we have. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.